All right, it says, I recently watched a video of Rabbi Singer denying that Jesus could possibly have foretold the destruction of the second temple because some of the stones in the temple in the temple wall were still on top of each other, although it seems that Jesus was speaking of the actual temple itself. At the same time, the rabbi says that Jesus' words were put into his mouth after 70 AD anyway. So which is it? Pure prevarication lies on the part of the gospel writers or a false prophecy made after the fact describing a destroyed sanctuary with an intact temple mount. I'm, be I'm beginning to think that the rabbi is a bit of a bigot. Okay, so we won't uh, mention the guy's name, but that's, that's where we're at. Rabbi, you want to comment on this? We find in, for example, Matthew 24, in Luke 19, 21, in Mark 13, we are told that Jesus tells of the destruction of the temple, the second temple. And in these passages, we are told Jesus says that in fact, not one stone will be on top of another. The temple will be destroyed. I pointed out something that's quite striking, the Western Wall, where we have quite a few stones on top of another. In fact, these are the largest stones ever used in construction. And this would convey that the so-called prophecy in the Christian Bible is false because there are stones on top of another. It should be said, of course, that the Christian Bible was written by people who don't know their names. They're written, I'm talking about the Gospels in particular, are written anonymously. The names, the inscriptions attached to them are from the second century. They're not in the manuscripts. The authors, Mark, which would chronologically very likely be the earliest gospel, was written about the year 70. The author of the book of Mark, according to some Christian editions, the book of Mark was written in Rome. We don't really know. But all of them knew that the temple was destroyed. And therefore we find the same text in Matthew and Luke as we find in the book of Mark. But we don't know where Matthew was written. But what people don't get is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, whoever wrote them, they weren't sitting in Yerushalayim in Jerusalem and looking at the Temple Mount. We have no way of knowing this. None of the authors identify themselves. Not only don't they identify themselves by name, they don't identify themselves as who they are. There's nowhere in the book of Matthew that the author claims to have been a disciple of Jesus. There's no way in the book of Mark where the author claims to have been a companion of Peter, as Christian tradition would later promulgate. There's nowhere in the book of Luke that conveys that the author was a companion of Paul. Okay. So therefore, it would seem at first glance that the, that the that the authors of the, that Matthew and Luke are clearly copying from Mark. Mark was about 70. Matthew and Luke were written about 15 years later, roughly the, about the year 85. One other point, this is not my opinion. This is the, the consensus opinion of, of Christians. In almost all Christian Bibles, when it talks, about, when you open up the book of Matthew, the, the commentator, if it's an annotated, Bible will say that the that according to tradition they believe it was written by Matthew, but when it comes to the date, it will vary. But it basically, Matthew will say written eighty five. Generally speaking, the more conservative the Bible is, the earlier it will place the authorship. The more liberal will place it a little bit later. But generally speaking, Mark is dated about the time of the destruction of the temple. The event was an epic, colossal event, destruction of the second temple. It was a huge event. It was the culmination of three and a half years of war between the Jews and Rome, a very well-known war from 66 to 70. So everybody knew about it and they spoke Conventionally, the temple was destroyed, and therefore those words were then put into the mouth of Jesus. As it appears to us, this so-called prophecy wasn't in fact correct because we see that there are stones that are very much on top of another. It should be said there are many, many other stones on the Temple Mount, and I've been there many, many times. 
that are still there one on top of another. In fact, we have the walls of, that go back to the time of Nehemiah that are there as well, if you know your way around the Temple Mount. There are some Christians who struggle with this and in fact claim, therefore, that the Jews have it wrong on Tel Mount, that this is a minority opinion. I don't want to represent, misrepresent, mischaracterize this opinion as a consensus. Most Christians never heard of this. But there are some Christians who have suddenly made themselves very loud in recent years saying, well, the Temple Mount is not where the Temple stood, and the Temple Mount is in Brooklyn. The Temple Mount is the city of David. It's somewhere else. They're all wrong. The Temple Mount, the Temple Mount. But the reason, if you follow those videos, and some people sent me the links tonight, the reason why some of these Christians are making these claims and, and stomping their heels, saying, if Tabal is not in it's somewhere else, is for this problem, because they know that if, in fact, the Temple Mount is where the Temple Mount is, it certainly makes the claim that, the, that, that one stone will not be on top of another to be a little torturous. One other point should be made, and then we're going to go to the final point of the question. As it turns out, we, the children of Israel, have a medrash that tells us that, in fact, the Western Wall will never be destroyed. And this is from a, a medrash rabbi that's uh, very, very old. It's not quite 2,000 years old, but it's a very, very ancient text. And guess what? The Western Wall is still there. So whereas the Christian claim that Jesus said that one stone will not be on top of another, it's not only is there, but it's there for everyone to see. And it's, in fact, one could say the most iconic part of the whole Temple Mount is the Western Wall. But in fact, our tradition is that it would remain. And when it says in the Book of Song of Songs in Shir Hashim that God will remain behind the wall, what does it mean? It means that wall, the Kaisal Maravi, the Western Wall. And guess what is here? Yushalayim has been conquered over and over again, many, many times, destroyed over and over again. And many, many walls were destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt. But this wall was never destroyed. So as it turns out, Jewish, ancient Jewish literature is on the money and ancient Christian literature is off base. Some Christians will argue, well, the Western Wall was not really a part of the Temple itself because the Western Wall is the outer wall of the Temple Mount. It really wasn't the wall of the Temple itself, but many Christians recognize that this might be problematic. And in fact, some have gone so far as to claim that the Temple Mount isn't Temple Mount. These are, they're their proof is, it's circular reasoning, that if Jesus said not one stone on the top of another, if the Temple Mount is the authentic Temple Mount, but the Western Wall is still there. If the Western Wall is still there, then what Jesus said was a lie. I don't believe Jesus ever said these things. The Gospel authors put these words into the mouth of Jesus. This was a epic event in Yerushalayim, in the Temple of the Jews, which was very well known to the, to the Roman world. And when it was destroyed, everybody knew about the destruction. And therefore, when the destruction was spoken of, whether it was in Greece, whether it was in Rome, whether it was in North Africa, it wasn't today where you have an internet where they had pictures. They go, oh, I see there are still some stones there. Maybe we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't say every stone, but most of the stones, the vast majority of stones, they couldn't do that. Why? Because they didn't know what they were talking about. To say that I'm a bigot, for saying this, I simply can't make sense of, of, of that serious charge. I'm not going to even respond to it because it's a, it's a charge that's so fatuous that, in fact, I, I give the award to whoever this, wrote this question, that he is the first person who whoever called me a bigot, whoever wrote it, waited for me to be 57 years old to make the charge. No one ever made it. I'm not a Christian because I believe that the teachings of Christianity are false. Am I biased? I don't know what that means either. And I always say to people, look it up for yourself and you draw your own conclusions. So in short, as it turns out, the vast majority of Christian scholars, the vast majority, the consensus is that Mark, Matthew, and Luke were all written at the time of the destruction of the Second Temple or after it. And therefore, they easily could have put it in there. So 
that stuff. Now, I grant that Christians believe on faith that Jesus actually said these things in the year 30. I grant that, that but that's their faith. They, you want to believe that, you can believe it. But don't argue that what we see in the Christian Bible proves that these prophecies could have only been expressed with some, by someone who is a representative of God. That's not a valid argument. If a Christian says, look, on faith, I believe these things, go ahead. But what makes you different than the beliefs of a Roman Catholic who believes in uh, Mary was born without the stain of original sin and believes that the Eucharist, the blood of the Eucharist, the wine of the Eucharist becomes the real blood and body of Christ? It's a matter of faith, but don't present your article of faith as something that could be proven. And if someone happens to find your article of faith to be unconvincing, doesn't mean unbiased, it means your answers are unsatisfying. So I leave it to you, the viewer, if I'm a bigot, and I leave it to you, the viewer, if you want to have a person sitting here in front of you going, hello, everybody, I never formed an opinion about anything. Is that what you want? Why would you ever listen to me? You'd go watch Eight is Enough. You'd watch reruns from I Love Lucy. Most of the people don't have time for such things. Anyways, I thank you for your question. It'd be like me writing a note today, dating it, you know, uh, 2010, and say, I predict that Donald Trump will be president in 2017 18. And then uh, my grandkids finding it like, 100 years from now, great, great, great game kids find my note that I wrote so long ago, but I put a false date on it. I didn't prophesy anything. So it'd be the equivalent of what you're saying is that since the gospel writers came long after Paul and long after the event supposedly took place, it could have very easily just been, like you said, words put in the mouth of, or very easily just made it up. I want to, I wanna, if I may, William, just, uh, just one other caveat would be in order here. People viewing the show may not be aware of how important this issue is. You may go, well, this seems like a, uh, a tangent, a, a side issue. As it turns out, if you read the patristic writings, the writings of the church fathers, they all spoke about the destruction of the Jewish temple as a sign of the blindness and the wrongness of the Jews and how they were guilty for killing Christ. And we see the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the utter destruction of the temple to be a, a witness to the fact that God was done with the Jews, okay? So I want to say that although this could be introduced as not a very important issue, it, the reason why this is going to gain a lot of traction is because we can go back to the writing of Melito, very early second century. We can go back to the to the bishop of of what is today France, Irenaeus. It wasn't at the time. We can go back to the writing of Tertullian, very early church father. We can go back to Origen. They all said made this claim that the fact that Jerusalem was destroyed, this is very early, the fact that Jerusalem was destroyed and Teba was utterly destroyed shows that God was, God was done with the Jews and it ain't coming back. And now God is working with the church and there's a new Jerusalem and it's done. And this will continue through the, um, through the Bishop of Hippo. This will be all over, the, this message will be a consistent theme in all of the writings of the church father. That's why this play is very heavy because the destruction of Yushalayim demonstrates that God was done with the Jews. The destruction temple means that God was, it was a symbol that God was finished with the children of Israel. Adon Olach, Asher Malach, V'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, V'et Nasa, V'chev Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech Shemu Nikra Ve'acharei Kiklot Akol Levado Imloch Noa Ve'wa'ya Ve'wa'ya